Um, and what, what I'm going to, we've got till 6.15, we've got 75 minutes here. So I'm going to spend, you know, eight to 10 minutes here on the front end. I'm going to describe the program, the homeownership program at Zumbro Ridge, just like a really high level summary um, and do an introduction of our three esteemed panelists. Uh, and then I'm going to open up the, the conversation um, with some structured questions that I worked with the panelists to develop ahead of time. And then we'll save the last 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on how quickly we, we move through some of these structured questions and open it up to the rest of the folks on the, the call. Um, if you are on a computer and you want to submit a question or something in the chat and you've, you're feeling ambitious, uh, and you want to learn how to <laughs> enter things into that chat, if you go in, down in the bottom of your window, you know, you see all those, you see the mute and the stop video on the left hand side, then you see invite participants, share and chat. If you click on that chat icon, it'll open up a side panel in your window and you can type in questions. Um, so if you want to use that function, like if you don't want to forget a question that occurs to you, you can type it in the chat. Uh, and then we can address that once we get to the open uh, Q&A at the end. Um, everyone good with that? You can give me a thumbs up. Sure. Yes. Okay. Let's get going. I'm going to share my screen with some slides. And can you see my, can you see the slides here? Okay. Mm -hmm. We're good. All right. Um, okay. So. I'm, I'm actually just going to keep the, the, I'm not actually going to go into the full screen mode because then I lose my view of the audience. So I'm just going to make it as large as I can here. Um, so what we're talking about this evening is a uh, homeownership program that uh, Zumbro Ridge Estates, Inc., um, the, the resident-owned community in Rochester, Minnesota, um, and really, and we've got the, the, really the brains behind this whole program with us as a panelist. Allie Lechner, the operations manager at Zumbro Ridge, is really the engine and the driver and so many other things associated with this program. So we'll give Allie uh, some time to answer some questions from folks because she's really the engine behind this whole thing. But like, like so many of the communities that we work with, um, Zumbro Ridge had a lot of vacant lots when they purchased the community back in 2017. And they had about 31-ish lots. And through this program and, uh, and, a couple of, and, a, and a couple of homes that Allie brought in through a different method, so eight homes for sure have, re have been brought in through this um, uh, home ownership program. Uh, so 10 lots total that they filled and they have 21 to go. And really the value that this has brought to Zumbro Ridge is that they've increased their revenue potential because of the new earned income from the, from the lot rents from these 10 uh, new uh, income generating lots is 45 grand a year. And that's 11% of their total operating budget. So it's been a huge boon and, and they keep, they've got more and more homes on order all the time. The strategy is to try to fill all 21 of their lots. Uh, so like I said, what, who we have with us tonight that are um, from the multi-organizational partnership in, in the Rochester area that made this happen with Allie. Uh, we've got Allie herself, um, who some of you may have met in um, uh, some of the other Common Ground sessions up until this point. Allie is also a board member at NCF. She's our newest board member at uh, North Country. And then we also have Justin Voss with us, who's a program manager at First Homes. And I'll describe a little bit more here uh, what First Homes uh, role is in the program. And then we have Amanda Adam Smith, who is a home lending advisor at First Alliance Credit Union. Um, and they're the lending partner. They're the, they're the entity that's making the home loans to the buyers of the homes in the uh, Zumbro Ridge Home Ownership Program. So I'm gonna show you this slide. This is a map showing uh, all the work that Zumbro Ridge, their partners, and Alley has really spearheaded to make these, all those orange little squares that you see, that's Zumbro Ridge of that map. Each one of those orange squares is a home that they brought in and sold uh, to a, you know, a, a home buyer, and they've gotten financed. And then those two green lots that I mentioned, those are lots that Alley filled by um, working with a local home dealer uh, to 
she, uh, she can explain more about it, but she partnered with a local home dealer to get two additional homes outside of the normal uh, regular program. And then what I want, so and all the blue squares are the, the lots that are still vacant. The other, one, the other map that I created that I wanted to show everyone on the call, just to illustrate like how, how Zumbra Ridge has really had to layer on a bunch of activity to get them to get to where they are today. So in addition to those other colors that you saw in that last map, we're adding those purple, these purple colors down here. Those are homes that NCF brought in in 2017 when Zumbra Ridge first became a, a co-op. Uh, so that's a part of, of, of the layers to get Zumbro Ridge where they're at in terms of occupancy. And then all of those pink uh, squares are homes that Zumbro Ridge, the board, everyone has really worked and done a lot of sweat equity to rehab those homes. So this is just to show you all that color on this map is just to show you how much work Zumbro Ridge has done, multiple hats off, um, to, to really get them where they are today. And they're and like I said, they're poised to fill all of these blue squares as well. So we're really excited um, to to talk about this program and have um, uh, folks from all of these different organizations that have made the program possible with us tonight. Really quickly, uh, I want to just quick give you an overview of all the partners that Zumbro Ridge had to bring together that made this program possible. So first of all, they have they have Zumbro Ridge, the resident-owned community. Um, and that's really been Allie being the project advocate um, and that sort of thing. And there, and Allie has also served in the role of the home sales associate, uh, if we want to call it that, if we want to put a title on it. Allie has been responsible for selling the homes, marketing the homes, showing the homes, all of that jazz. So Zumbro Ridge and the home sales associate are two components of this program. The other part is the is is first homes, which we have Justin from uh, tonight. First Homes is a program or a subsidiary. I don't know how you describe it, Justin. You can describe the relationship yourself, but it's First Homes is like a program of the Rochester Area Foundation, um, which is the funder of this whole activity. Uh, so Rochester Area Foundation and First Homes are acting as both the funder and the fiscal agent for this program. Uh, so let me describe what that means. Rochester Area Foundation uh, provided a revolving line of credit to, Zum to Zumbro Ridge um, to purchase homes, place them, sell them, recycle the money. So when the home gets sold, um, each home has, is about 68000 or that's how they size it on the front end. They sell that $68,000 home, they recycle it back into the revolving line of credit, and that line of credit is held with first homes. First homes, when that's recycled, they go and they, they work with Allie to purchase another home. So they just keep recycling that line of credit over and over. Uh, and those funds uh, live with, with First Homes. First Homes also brought to the table a down payment assistance program for, uh, or a fund, a pool for folks that want to purchase the homes uh, to the table. And that's been a, a super innovative um, component of this whole thing is that you've got First Homes that is, is both serving as this fiscal agent, they're housing the money, they're working with the co-op to, to place the homes, order the homes and revolve that line of credit, but they're also providing this really valuable down payment assistance source. That brings us to First Alliance Credit Union, who's a really critical partner. First Alliance is the lender, as I mentioned before, and, and they're providing home buyer uh, financial counseling, which has been a critical, critical component of the success of this program as well. And not every credit union lends on, not every bank, not every credit union lends on manufactured homes. And not every single one provides financial counseling. So Zumbro Ridge, the, a huge boon to the program, has been this partner in this local credit union, um, who not only is bringing the financing for home buyers, but it's also providing some education and um, uh, counseling to the home buyers that are coming through the program. And then we, who we don't have as a panelist tonight, but who is also a critical partner in this whole program, was Homes of Harmony. They're the uh, licensed home builder and installer. And they happen to be located just a stone's throw away from Zumbro Ridge. So Allie and the Rochester Area Foundation were working with that dealer. Uh, the guy that they were working with, his name is Denny. So they were working with Denny really closely on picking homes and that sort of thing. So those are the kind of rough ingredients of the partners that are involved in this whole um, uh, program. And just to give you the, the key ingredients to success of 
really of what's gen what's the engine behind all of this it's Zumbro Ridge getting a three hundred forty thousand dollar line of credit from Rochester Area Foundation that number was based on sixty eight thousand dollars of a total development cost per home times five they were hoping to do five you know an initial placement of five and then keep recycling it which they've been doing with success and then the foundation also provided a thirty thousand dollar just free money grant to to Zumbro Ridge to do vacant lot prep. Uh, they didn't have the resources from their um, uh, their their capital improvement reserve to fund some of that prep that needed to happen, and so the, the foundation showed up uh, with that um, grant to allow them to do that lot prep. Uh, the foundation also made a lot of connections and worked with Allie and the board to develop connections to bring in other beautification projects and and other things to get them really prepped and ready to go um, to sell homes once they came in. And uh, just the another thing that's important about this line of credit for y'all to know is that uh, Zumbro Ridge has five years. So the, I mean, it's great to have the line of credit, but they've got five years, which is a long time to have a line of credit out. Um, NCF has had lines of credit in the past and they're typically three to four years. So Rochester Area Foundation was willing to give them five years to, you know, to earmark this money so that they could use it to recycle it and place homes. So that's huge. So Rochester Area Foundation, first homes, really critical upfront component to making this program successful. Um, and then we can talk about more of the other ingredients for success when we get into the questions here. But I really wanted folks to understand, you know, what's the financial bits that are uh, driving this. And then I've got some photos here of Allie and um, one of the first home buyers, Amanda, who's now, she the treasurer, treasurer or the secretary? Treasurer? Yeah. Uh, so this is the new home buyer, Amanda, and, and Allie hit her up right away. <laughs> got her to be on the board of directors. So that's great. And then this is another home that was placed. And this gentleman, this was a special case because he came in, bought the home, and immediately uh, went and put in this sweet awning um, carport and Allie sent some other photos and he's got like a sweet like fire pit area back patio so the home buyers that are coming into Zumbo Ridge are already making like lots of investments in their property and they're already giving back to the community so that's been another huge component of, of why this program is successful um, so with that I'm now going to um, let I'm going to call on each of our panelists to just give them give a, a quick introduction of themselves, and then I'm going to get into the question some of the pre pre um, pre created questions that we have. So Allie, let's start with you. Why don't you wave and let people know who you are and what your what your uh, uh, role is in your community, and then uh, if you want to add a little bit more about what your role has been in this home ownership program. Hey everybody, I'm Allie. Um, I'm the operational manager on the board at Zumbro Ridge Estates. Um, I'm also the park manager. Um, I'm also the redeveloper, the infill, per infill person, and the grant writer um, for the community. Um, what else did you want to know? Um, so to get this started, we... Hmm, my background is redevelopment of, of extremely distressed properties. Um, so I went to a board meeting about six months after we bought the property. Um, I noticed that nothing had changed and I also noticed that our front sign had an, a disconnected phone number on it. And um, I was a little concerned because I knew with all of the vacancies that were here that we weren't gonna make it unless something was done. So I went to a board meeting, I asked a lot of questions, and I walked out of the board meeting with a position of operational manager. Um, what I did from there is I literally picked up paintbrushes and garbage bags and I started doing a lot of work on the community myself. And um, by the next board meeting, I then came up with an idea. I told them that I believed that I could turn our park around. And I started explaining what the concepts of my ideas were. Um, but that there was a lot of work that needed to be done before we could go forward with that. 
such as um, Victoria had mentioned, we had nine rental units. We also had a separate loan on those nine rental units that needed to be paid off. Um, so those nine rental units, we needed to find out if those people were going to purchase the unit and if they weren't, we needed to decide on a deadline as to when they had to be out so that we could renovate them and sell them. Out of the nine units, one person stayed. The other eight units all needed to be renovated. Um, we were operating with no money. So that meant that volunteers had to do all of the work. I needed to find organizations that were willing to not only help with volunteer work, but were also able to help us with um, donating carpet, paint, all of those types of things. Um, we were able to do that, and all of those homes were remodeled and they were sold. Um, Victoria also showed you the map where we had the six um, FEMA homes that were brought in. There was only one of those FEMA homes that were sold. The other five were here, but they were vacant. They needed to be sold. Um, so I immediately started on working on how to sell those. And um, then we, we got through that part. We also organized monthly cleanups. We would have anywhere from 10 to 49 people at a time show up for these cleanup days. We literally went through and we picked up trash on 17 acres of land. We trimmed trees, we cut grass, we cut weeds. We did everything in our power to beautify the park. Because I knew from experience that if I was gonna sell anybody outside of us and helping us with financially in bringing in homes, we needed to look a lot better than we looked physically. We accomplished that and I then started going to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting of affordable housing organizations in Rochester. Um, I, I can't tell you how many I went to. And, but each meeting I went to, I was introduced to somebody else that could be beneficial to us and that wanted to be beneficial to us. This was churches, this was, um, eventually Rochester Area Foundation and a gentleman by the name of Steve Bogart. And um, Steve was the director of Rochester Area Foundation. He sat down with me and he said, okay, kid, what's your plan? So I laid it out for him and um, to my surprise, he believed in me. He believed in our program. And he helped us in so many ways for so long in, in getting us connected with people that he knew from different companies that would donate their time and their materials to help us. That helped us to get to the point where Steve helped me put the program together and I presented it to Rochester Area Foundation. And I sat on pins and needles for quite a few months waiting for a decision because what I was asking for was a lot. I, I was asking for over $300,000 and I was asking for thousands of dollars to help me get the lots ready because we had lots that had been vacant for 20 plus years. Sewer lines didn't work. Electricity didn't work. Um, we had overgrown trees for 20 plus years. Trees had to come down. There was a lot of work that had to be done. And I got a phone call and he said, are you sitting down? And I said, yeah. And he goes, good, because they're going to let you have what you requested. And I was really, really excited and so grateful and so humbled. So then the next step is to get all of the board members to also believe as strongly as you believe and show them, okay, this is what we have in front of us. This is what we can do. But also realizing the cost isn't going to be completely covered by what we would ask for and what we would receive. So our revenue had to increase. That meant 
that it wasn't we could bring in two homes a year. That meant we needed to bring in multiple homes a year or none of us would have affordable housing here. Um, and that's where we started. That's how it all began. Thanks, Allie. That was a really great intro to how it all happened. And that's a Sorry great- about the crying. I get emotional. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Um, it's a, yeah, it's huge. I mean, that's why we're talking about it tonight. Cause it's a huge, it's a massive win. And, um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's great. And what you touched on there with the, um, the, the connection with Steve at the foundation and all of that, I want to bring in the other panelists here because one of my first questions is for our panelists is, um, uh, if, if you want to describe both from your, maybe from your own standpoint or from on, on, on the part of your business or organization that you're representing, kind of what the value proposition was or what was the calculus or reasoning why you got involved in the program uh, and why, why it was important for your organization to get involved. And uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Justin, if you want to answer that question on part of First Homes. Yeah, um, yeah, I'd be glad. Do you want me to to give a little more background on the foundation? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, if you want to um, fill in, not that there's really any gaps. You guys did good uh, good job covering what we're doing, but I did want to just clarify a little bit because there's sort of I guess I'm sort of representing three organizations. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Uh, Ali alluded to a gentleman named Steve Borkhart, uh, who was the, uh, who worked, he, re he just retired, but he was at the Rochester Area Foundation uh, in the role of director for the coalition of Rochester Area Housing. And that's a funders uh, group. Um, and the foundation is just one of the four. So the, the other funders are the city of Rochester Olmstead County and Mayo Clinic. Um, so they all chipped in uh, money into this housing fund. Um, and I think there was something like $4 million um, at the start three or four years ago. And, um, and so that's where Allie pitched her idea um, and was ultimately approved. And so um, the Rochester Area Foundation sort of houses that money and um, and so that's how First Homes got involved is um, we're a nonprofit uh, housing organization. And uh, so this is the kind of stuff that we do. Um, typically we've done a lot of single family site built construction, uh, single family um, and uh, a little bit of multifamily and a few condos. Um, primarily all for the community land trust. Um, so I guess sort of trying to answer your original question, Tori, um, I mean, I wasn't there for the, so I can't give you like firsthand account of what the discussion was or why um, the nitty gritty of why they decided to award this, this money to, to Zumbo Ridge, but I did ask Jen Woodford, who's the current president of the foundation, um, that question and uh, and her answer was along the lines of um, because this community um, you know converted over to uh, a member owned um, manufactured home park and um, because of Allie and her spirited <laughs> um, lobbying efforts um, it seemed like a great you know formula for success um and that you know that this place really needed some preservation and, and this was a, a great step forward um so it sounded like it was really a no-brainer um and so um yeah i hope i hope that answers your question but yeah um, and and so they they stepped in and, and i think ali mentioned this uh, the coalition stepped in and, and helped sort of in two ways. They offered up the $30,000 grant, so that doesn't need to be repaid, um, to pay for lot preparation, 
or improvements. Um, and uh, on top of that, I think uh, a local plumbing um, and a local uh, gravel and asphalt company has done a lot of work uh, pro bono on top of that. So really help those dollars stretch further. Um, so that's, Great. that's what I, that's what I know about it. Excellent. Thanks, Justin. So Amanda, I'll, um, I'll, I'll give you the two pronged opportunity to answer both the first Alliance question and your, your role and what for who first Alliance is. And then why'd you, why, why, uh, why did First Alliance decide to get involved? All right, sounds good. Um, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Amanda. Um, I am the Home Lending Advisor with First Alliance Credit Union. I have been here for eight years. Um, seven of those eight years I was in the real estate department and just recently in March moved um, to the uh, manufactured home lending advisor position. So. Um, we're just a credit union um, that basically started in 1932. Um, it was seven firefighters during the Great Depression. You know, finances weren't that great back then. So, you know, 80 some odd years later, here we are. Um, with Miss Alley, um, I'm not sure how we started as a credit union with Miss Alley, but I know I personally met her in March and fell in love with her. And I'm like, we're going to do this. This is, we're going to make this work we're going to figure this out. Um, and so just my role is to make sure my members are financially stable enough to put them into an affordable home. Um, you know, it's a big need in the community now, um, you know, with rent going sky high and, you know, for first time home buyers, maybe not putting them to fail with a mortgage, let them kind of train in the manufactured home world. So it's, it's all rather brand new to me, but it's been a learning opportunity and realizing um, that I am, I'm really, really passionate about it, getting people into the homes, into working with Allie and working with Justin to make sure not only do we get those lots filled, but making sure, you know, as owners that they are set up for success. Excellent. And as long as I've got you queued up, uh, Amanda, the, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you specifically is um, just about kind of big picture, like was First Alliance doing manufactured housing lending? Like how typical is that for credit unions and banks to be doing lending? And uh, maybe you describe a little bit about um, the, the rates and terms and, you know, just like a high level view of, of kind of how you're lending on these. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we started lending in probably about two, 2007, 2008. Um, that's when it all really started. And it really has been just kind of an up and down, seeing what works, what works here, what works there. Um, and of course, as today, we're still doing them. Um, not a lot of people are doing them because it is a high risk um, type of lending. Um, since it is put on a lot, not necessarily permanent um, for a lender and their collateral if wanted to, which it hasn't happened yet, but if wanted to, they could take off with our collateral and we wouldn't have a clue where our collateral is. Um, so it is risk-based pricing and that's what it's called. So our rates kind of range. Um, they are not um, based off the secondary market um, and they pretty much range from about 6%, um, just kind of depending on rate term, down payment, those kind of um, aspects. And then um, again, depending on rate term and down payment, it could possibly go up to a little bit over 9%. Um, and I know that's kind of scary in the big scheme of things when it comes to the rate, but we also offer um, you know, terms to where it, depending on, you know, versus the mortgage, if you're looking at a 30 year with a low rate that stretched out interest versus, you know, that short term, and that little bit of higher rate. So um, we do offer 5, 10, 15, possibly 20 year terms, um, kind of depending on the newer um, homes, but we try to make it affordable and we don't want, and I think that's the scariest part of it is the rate, because that's the first thing they ask and compared to the secondary market and then listening to the, you know, to those rates, it kind of freaks people out a little bit, but it's all about affordability explaining to them how it works 
and not leaving any questions on the table. So, yeah. So, yeah, we, like I said, we, we try and offer as much as we can. They're not, you know, a lot of banks, a lot of credit unions don't want to do um, this type of lending because it's just a little too risky for them. Mm -hmm. um, but we recognize the need in the community for affordable housing. So, as a credit union, that's what we do. We help our people. So, we came up with the program and here it is. Yeah, just for context for other, for everyone on the call, credit unions have really been a source that resident-owned communities across the country have tapped for financing for, for new home placement because it's really hard to find traditional lenders. And as long as we're on this topic, I want to hang out here because I saw a couple of really good questions related to, uh, we've got a question from Pat at Park Plaza, and, and Pat's asking a great question, which is, um, uh, and I could take a crack at answering this, but Amanda, maybe you can share from your perspective as a lender. Why do, why do lenders consider manufactured housing to be riskier than other types of loans? Um, because um, with the lending, it's not necessarily considered like a real estate loan. There's no mortgage on it. It's actually considered um, on a, the consumer side where it's a title. So from a lien perspective, we can have a title, but like I said, with the manufactured home, if they want to throw four wheels on this thing and take off, they could do that. It's not permanently set on the lot. And if it was, then that would be the real estate side because then you would be owning the lot. But since it's, you know, in this, in, in the park and it's not necessarily permanent to the ground, then it, it's a little bit more riskier because like it, not that it will happen or that it has happened, but that's why it's considered kind of risky because it's almost looked at like a huge car rather than like a thick built home. Yeah, that's, and that's a great answer. And that is something that NCF has been grinding on at the state legislature and nationally. And what Amanda's referencing when she says title, you know, in a, for a site built home, you're getting its real property, whatever that means. But the, the grand poobahs of finance have decided that homes like that are site built are real property and they're titled as real property. That comes with a set of financing options. Uh, manufactured homes on a land lease community where you don't own the land underneath, it's considered a chattel loan or like that's like a car loan or any kind of personal property loan. And that comes with riskier when lenders look at it there are higher interest rates because they consider that riskier amanda when we talked before what we have been talking about is one of the things that ncf has been working on i wanted to make sure to mention this is finding ways to change the way that homes are titled in co-ops when you've got security of land um, when you've got that ownership interest and and working out ways to make financing more affordable and and, and really improving those terms because it's so critical um, uh, but I, I just want to give uh, First Alliance really big kudos because it's hard to find lenders that will lend on manufactured housing as it is. There's still a long way to go with manufactured housing finance. We all know that. Um, and there'll be lots of opportunities to engage in changing that in the future. But, you know, hats off to First Alliance. Uh, you know, without a lending partner, the, none of this would have been possible. And uh, everyone that I've talked to at First Alliance has been just spot on amazing um, uh, folks to work with. So thanks so much for being on. The oh, call. you're too kind. You're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. We've got a long way to go and, um, on the, on the financing Absolutely. space, but it's awesome that first Alliance has been able to, to play that role, uh, for, for Zumbro Ridge. Um, let's pivot the conversation a little bit here. I'm keeping track of time. Um, let's move to, uh, let's move to some, you know, big picture questions about what some of the biggest challenges for this program have been. Um, and let's start with, or opportunities for growth in the future or things that you could tweak and change in the future, uh, because we want continual process improvement here. That's part of the reason why we're doing this so that we can take this program and do it again and again in other communities. So Allie, let's start with you. If you want to, if you want to talk about one or two examples of things that like if you were gonna do a program like this, like what would you change or what do you need to keep in mind? Um, so I'm, I'm gonna throw that one out there and then we'll toss it around to Amanda and Justin as well. The biggest challenge is getting people to be able to see your vision and getting away from the stigma of trailers, trailer trash. Um, helping them to see that you are resident owned, 
that there's pride in your community and that all of your residents care. Um, and that if they help you reach your goals, um, that it will provide generations of everlasting affordable housing for families. Um, that, that's the biggest challenge. Um, on property, what the biggest challenge is having the people that have gone through years and years of delinquent maintenance and false promises believe you when you tell them that this can be a reality, but that it's going to take work and it's going to take all of us to work as partners together in order to make it happen. That's, that's great because you, you got really close to answering Pat's question in the chat here. And Pat asked earlier on, she said, how did you motivate your neighbors to participate in the renewal and cleanup of your community? And, and you're kind of getting at that, answering that question there. But if you want to dig in a little bit more on like, what were the strategies? Like, how did you build that trust in the community? Like, how, how did you convince people that it was different? I spent hours and hours day after day by myself making improvements in the community. And slowly but surely, people started to ask questions. Why are you doing this? What do you get paid to do this? What are you getting out of this? And then I would start the conversation. And I would tell them the vision that I had for our community. And slowly, people bought into it. And our first cleanup sessions that first year were absolutely amazing. Um, people came out and, and they really pitched in and they rolled up their sleeves. And I have to say, it's difficult getting people who have rented for years and years and years to understand that they now own an equal share of the community. Mm -hmm. And they um, now have equal responsibility in making us a success or in them and everybody else around them not having affordable housing. And um, you have to have a board, an entire board that believes the same thing you do to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Because it's difficult if you have a board where it's separated and doesn't believe in that dream, I call it, because then residents will talk to them and they'll, they'll get discouraged. But if you have a board that's unified and everybody can see the dream, they can see the end results, so that when the members in the community talk to them, we all give the same responses. That makes a huge difference. It makes a really, really big difference. Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about there is like building this, you're building a culture, right? You're, you're leading by example, first of all, which is setting the spark. And then you're building this culture around being a co-op and being member owners and, you know, being all in it together, which is a constant challenge in all the communities that we work with. I mean, that's the co-op challenge. Um, well, what we always say is we're a community within a community. We want everybody to come home and feel proud of where they live. We want each and every child to feel when they get off that bus stop, they're, they're proud and they want their friends to come and visit. And so we, we strive by not only improving the community in those regards, but by also implementing um, after school programs for our children, a community library for our children. Um, when the pandemic started, a food shelf for everybody out here that needed food, which we got donations from other ch from churches. Um, we, we started our first national night out. Um, this, would, this would be our third, but it's canceled. Um, we have our own Easter bunny on site. We have a, a huge Easter egg hunt. Um, we have an, our, our own elf on site. 
there's not a family or a child in this community that goes without a Christmas present. Um, we have tried to make it as loving, as safe, and as comfortable as can possibly be. That's awesome, Allie. That's, that's just incredible. Your testimony and the way that you talk about Zumbra Ridge, it's like, it's no wonder that people weren't like, yeah, let's get our gloves on and our shovels out and get going. Um, so yeah, thank you for that response. It's super inspiring. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off to Justin. If you wanna answer the question, I'll restate it again. Uh, the question was, you know, what were some of the, um, you know, if we were gonna replicate this in other communities, like what are some of the things to watch out for, key lessons learned? Um, you know, it's kind of an open-ended question there, but. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> real quick, I wanted to say like, yeah, the attitude that Ali has brought to the neighborhood is, has been really magnetic. Um, it's not, and it's pulled in not just the, not just her neighbors, but you know, sort of the community more at large. Um, and uh, so that's been really cool to see firsthand. Um, challenges, um, yeah, it's a, I'm, I'm such a small piece, or First Homes is such a small piece of this. I, I, I feel like Allie probably faces the, the, the challenges um but i think um i think what's been really important has been sort of the the team effort that we've had between um between alley and and first homes and first alliance and homes of harmony um you know we've had really good communication and uh, um and i think and kind of like ali said with her board like having that common goal that we know what we're working toward has been uh, has been pretty good motivation, I think. And um, so there haven't, you know, there really hasn't been any sort of anybody getting upset or um, things have gone pretty smoothly. Now, right now we're facing some challenges with uh, being able to deliver homes in a, in a timely fashion. Um, but that's just sort of, construction at large right now um because of the pandemic and the economic downturn and yeah it's just it's all that and now with wildfires and hurricanes and um you know lumber prices and lumber shortages are just um sliding project schedules way back unfortunately hmm. so uh i don't think we there's really nothing you can do to be proactive and and cure that but uh yeah, I think just having a good solid team and um, people that are, you know, really invested in, in seeing a positive outcome has, has been, um, you know, I think is really um, proving uh, to be helpful here, so. Excellent. Yeah, you guys mentioned that when we met beforehand, the, the good communication. Uh, Amanda, I'll give the floor to you. What, what, do you. what do you see as opportunities for improvement or, you know, lessons learned, things that you might do differently? Um, yeah, um, with anything, there's always opportunities for improvement, especially from a lender um, perspective. Um, I'm actually trying to get out there and I've done podcasts, I've done radio stuff and newspapers to really get it out there about manufactured homes. Um, like Ali said, there's a stigma to them, and it's important that we get out there as a community, as neighbors, and, you know, deliver to the people, like, it's possible. Don't think that it's not possible. Um, not a lot of people still even know that we lend for manufactured homes. Um, actually, word of mouth, um, through Ali, through Homes of Harmony, having my business cards at the different parks, um, but I think my biggest challenge, um, is actually two things. Really, it's from the affordability standpoint. One, um, be, so far we haven't had this problem yet, but I'm, I get worried that we'll run into it, is that um, from an affordability standpoint, um, making sure my member or my, um, you know, my borrower is able to get this home. I don't want them to get their hopes up. And it's like, okay, we're gonna get into this and then come to me and it's, you know, something that's not, feasible. However, 
Um, the good thing about First Alliance is that we do, um, it's called a HILAS program, which is called High Yield Lending Solutions. So we do basically A, B, C, and D type paper. It's not just A and B, we don't look at it from that aspect. It's a big picture in all. So um, I, I'm excited about that, um, that we're able to even offer that, because I know even from a standpoint of if people did lending for manufactured homes, it would have to be like that A and B paper. Um, sometimes people forget life happens, you know. Um, we may not have the best credit or we may have something on there. So that's another thing from the lender um, to get out there. Like, don't be scared to apply. Let's work this out. Let's figure this out because what we can do from my seat is that if we can't get it to you now, if we can't get you in a home now, let's financially work on it together to get you into that home. So um, I think that's a challenge for me. Um, and another challenge is I'm really trying to, while it, they call it the risky lending, um, those rates. <laughs> I know I'm only one person to really work on it, but that that is really hard for me because I look at it as, you know, we don't want to discourage them from applying because they see those rates when, you know, from the secondary markets, like, oh, rates have been this low, historically low, you know, in, you know, the last couple of months or this, this last year. So it's really just about getting up there and, you know, just putting our face out there and really just going for the gold and getting those lots filled from, you know, Alley's Park or in sell from Homes of Harmony and then working with Justin. And, you know, with those two, it has been a complete pleasure because we keep in touch, you know, from a lending standpoint, I can let them know about an applicant. So if they maybe need to move on, because one, I don't want them waiting. If I can see it ahead of the time to say, maybe this is something that may not work, um, and that's the thing about it, is that we can be candid with each other and it's like, okay, now what do we do? What can we do to move forward to make sure, you know, things are still flowing from Allie's perspective, Justin, as well as myself as the lender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, maybe what we should, maybe before we open it up, I think the last thing that I wanted to, to touch on is just kind of go through um, Allie, maybe if you want to just go through, like, pretend pretend I'm an interested home buyer. Okay. I'm, I'm Jane Doe coming off the street. Um, and I call you just walk me through the process. You're taking me through what, what do I do and where, where, where do I go to who and when? Hi Jane. Um, how did you hear about us? Oh, I saw your ad on, I saw the ad that you, um, that you bombed on that other, uh, rental building. Sidebar, just really quick sidebar. One of Allie's marketing strategies on this whole thing was to go and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, no, no one's recommending this, but it, it shows her grit. Uh, but she would go on these uh, multifamily rental buildings were advertising that they had new units available. And Allie would go on and she was like, why be a renter when you can own? <laughs> and went and, and generated some leads uh, through that channel. So that's why I'm saying I, I, I found out Jane uh, from look, I was looking at that rental building and I saw your, I saw your, your note about owning and I'm interested in owning Allie. You probably shouldn't have said that with Justin in the room. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Justin. Um, okay. Well, where do you live now? Um, I rent a single family home in Rochester. All right. Do you have any children? Um, I have two children. Oh, what are their ages? Um, five and three. All right. Well, you are absolutely going to love Zumbro Ridge Estates. We are unique in so many ways. We have, we are a resident owned mobile home community. And what that means to you is not only when you own your home here, do you also own an equal share of our entire community? And that leads me up to what does our community hold for you? Well, we worked very, very hard in the last few months and we now have a fabulous, can you see it? A fabulous new playground and basketball court 
that is available for your beautiful children to play on. We also have an after school program on Thursdays for your children. They're invited into our community center. They're served a snack and either a juice or water. And they're able to choose books or games from our vast majority of books and games that we have. They can take them home and they don't ever have to bring them back. It's theirs. Now let me tell you about our homes. I presume that you would like a three bedroom, two bath. Yes. All right. Well, let me tell you about the one that I have available right now. This home is absolutely beautiful. You may have heard about mobile homes in the past and about how they leak air and they don't, and your utility bills are high. You don't have anything to worry about with this home. This home is built out of what they call stick house material. It has extra insulation in the floors, ceilings, and walls. You can literally pay utilities on your home for pennies a day. And that is a guarantee from Homes of Harmony, the owner of the home and or the manufacturer of the home. These homes come with beautiful interior. I can send you a virtual tour because right now I don't have any on site. What would be your email address and I can get that right back to you? Well, it is Victoria at NorthCountryFoundation.org. All right. Hang on one second. Let's get that out to you. All right. You have it. <laughs> <laughs> you have it. So when I, when I, if you've got a home on site, do it, you show it to me and then I go to Amanda or who, who, who approves okay. me first? I can tell you. Okay. So I say it right now. I should have said it the way I do when they're on site. I have a, one available unit right now, and I am available to give you an, a tour seven days a week at your convenience. Is there a time that would work for you? Anytime. <laughs> All right. Well, let's set it. It is 10 o'clock in the morning, so how about I meet you there at noon? Sounds great. All right. Are you familiar with where we're located? Yes. Okay. All right, I will meet you at lot 100. And then we at meet. Noon. All right, all right, it's noon. I meet you. Hi, how are you? Doing great. <laughs> all right, are you ready? Let's pretend that I have my two kids with me too and they're being really noisy. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Is the playground on the way in? Yes. All right, well, let's go on in. Are you guys excited too? Are you ready to choose your new home and your new bedrooms? Kelly's right. really good at this role playing thing. All right, so now we're inside. All right, look at how spacious these homes are. Look at the material on the walls and the light fixtures. Aren't they truly beautiful? All right, you guys are in a hurry to see these bedrooms. Let's go this way. Ah, which one of you wants this room? Oh, I would too. Ah, and in between you guys' bedrooms, you have your own private bath. Uh-huh, this one works for you too? All right, well, let's go show mom all the special things in the kitchen. All right, mom, look at the ceiling fan we have up here. And what do you think about the bar being located in the kitchen where it is? It makes your living room so much more spacious. And look at this, you got a walk-in closet or a pantry, isn't that awesome? All right, they're excited. Let's go this way, mom. All right, here is where your washer and dryer are. And right here is the master bedroom. Isn't this huge? You have a walk-in closet over here, you have another closet over here, and you have your own full private bath. Allie, are, are all of the homes in the program, are they the same layout? No. No? I'm giving you the layout of the last one I sold. Okay. All right. Um, and we can, we can share um, after the session what some of the layouts of some of the homes that they've sold in the program are. Um, what I do, I've got to speed, speed this up if you want me to finish. What I do then to help Amanda is I ask what they're about, does she know approximately what her annual income is? Does she know approximately what her credit score is? Does she approximately know how much debt there is compared to what her income is? 
And I asked how much rent she's paying now. Okay. Um, I do ask if there's any out, uh, any outstanding large debts that still need to be paid off because this helps us to screen people. So Amanda isn't spending a great deal of time going through um, the entire process with somebody that say only makes $10,000 a year. Mm -hmm. They're not going to qualify to live here. Sure. You know, and then I also give them all of the criteria that Ma Amanda requests um, for an interview with her plus her business card. And then I also tell them about the gap loan and we have a brochure made up that tells what the steps are to go through if you're purchasing the home um, using a gap loan or if you're not using a gap loan. And it, it just it outlines it completely. Okay, so so you're that's okay. That's interesting. So you're doing some screening on the front end. Yes, it hel it helps both of us. Okay. Yeah. And then it's their responsibility to reach out to Justin and Amanda. Yes, they reach out to Amanda first. Okay. Justin doesn't become involved um, until they've been approved for the loan, and then we that I. I kind of like to keep Justin informed and say, hey, I believe blah, 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 it's going to be sold. And um, I've had to write back. Yeah, I've had to write back and say, sorry, it didn't go through. But yeah, sure. try to keep everybody on the same page. Okay. Yeah, and what's nice is that if you get approved for, from Amanda at First Alliance through the program, uh, First Homes will take that as, right, they'll automatically qualify for the down payment, Justin? Yeah, if they yep. We kind of we kind of lean on First Alliance to tell us what you know what they need, or um, but typically there's no there's no really um, application process for the gap loan. It's basically uh, if Amanda says they need three thousand dollars, we you know we look and make sure their their income is not too high or that they're you know fitting into our um, qualifications but from an underwriting standpoint we just trust that they're gonna you know make the payments which um we typically spread out over 10 years and it's a two percent um interest rate so um so it's really reasonable you know they're getting three or four or five thousand dollars for you know maybe thirty dollars a month um so it's that's been a been a um, been a nice program, but surprisingly, I would say what maybe fifty percent of the the buyers have needed it. Maybe not even that many. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So it's so they're yeah, kind of pleasantly close. surprised how many people have been saving up and have their own down payment. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite nice, but you know there are some that do not have it in you know i've asked justin a few times like well this qualifies this too old or you know i'll have him look at it from his standpoint before kind of moving forward but for the most part you know they've had their own savings their own down payment which is that shows a lot especially to a lender like okay they they have a good savings that shows history of savings so that that's a good deal there okay awesome well i'm gonna I, Allie, I'm going to say that was a beautiful role playing experience. So thank you. And thanks for everyone for going along on the ride. <laughs> um, I look so well forward to you being a new resident with us. <laughs> your kids are absolutely I'm sold. Excited. I'm sold. All right. One other thing I'd like to quick say is there is the income qualifications. It's not only if the, if the person only makes $10,000 a year, they have to be at 80% or below medium income. Right. Um, okay, so now I'm going to open it up for questions. You can either unmute yourself and ask. You can put it in the chat. Um, if if folks have uh, specific questions for Allie or Justin or Amanda, um, now is the time. That was a heavy sigh, Pat. Do you have a question? <laughs> I didn't realize I was off mute. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm thinking about 
tell me again, Allie, how did you get started in, who did you approach first to say, who can help us provide the homes? Who can help us provide financing? Who did you approach in what order to get it all together? Okay, I will try to remember that. Um, the first thing that had to be um, done was to, to convince the board that what okay. I was suggesting was anything that could be done. Um, and then in convincing the board, I also had to help them to understand that I needed their trust. Um, what I mean by that is when you approach the organizations that I approach, they're not going to deal with an entire board. The, your board at your community has to be able to trust that you can represent their community exactly as you say to them you're going to do. Um, I, I, I got that first. Um, we lost a couple board members during that. Um, they could not see the vision. Um, didn't think there would be one home that came in here. Did not think that there were any amenities that could be brought in here. Um, just thought we were what we were and that was it. So there was, there was some transitions of board members at that, that time. Um, after we got to that point and it was in a regular meeting where they documented, yes, Allie, we, we will let you be the spokesman for our community and we trust that you're going to do what you say. So at that point, then I literally started going to the affordable housing meetings wherever I could go. From the affordable housing um, community meetings, I saw and heard different individuals that I then approached or they approached me and we discussed the plan and, and how to go about it. And um, so I guess fast tracking it past those things, um, there were many, many people and um, many people led me to the same source, which was Steve Bogart. Um, so Steve Bocart, he's a wonderful man. Um, he's very intimidating at first because he's very, very tall. <laughs> and I'm very, very short. Um, but he, uh, he's very sweet. At any rate, from there then, he helped me to see the possibility even this bigger than what I could see. You know, ooh, really? I can go to Superior Plumbing and, and I can ask them if, if they'll do 30,000 plus dollars worth of work for plumbing? <laughs> do you, really? Yeah, you can do that. Oh, I, you want me to meet in front of the entire electrical union board in, in Rochester <laughs> and ask them what? what? Oh. They might donate all the electrical work for the first six lots. Wow. Okay. So then I got the hang of it and thinking, wow, people will respond. And they did. Um, the Carpenters Union, they built our kids a bus shelter because ours was falling apart. Our community center had windows that weren't functional. Roy's Construction replaced our windows. Um, the old manager's house had a garage door that was dilapidated and falling apart. Uh, Thompson garage door. They put a brand new garage door in with remote control, you know? Um, and the, the majority of these people, it was 15 minute conversations. Oh yeah, we'd like to be involved. And, and then the churches. You know, Bear Creek Church, you know, Justin, Amanda, you, you know about Bear Creek Church down here. They do a phenomenal job and they outreach all over the place. And this guy by the name of Jeff Urban, yep. and I contacted him and he came out right away and he met with me and he said, you have nine units that you need to have renovated. Well, let me tell you, 
I have a way to get you carpet for those units. You can't install it, but I can get you the carpet free. Wow, awesome. And he said, if there were times when there weren't enough volunteers here to help, and I'd call him up and I'd say, you know, my arm's wearing out and I got this whole unit to get painted. Do you have anybody? Yeah, he'll be on over about noon tomorrow. Can you meet him there? And that happened over and over and over. Um, and the more that the more that the people in the community saw this stuff going on and happening, the more questions that were asked and the, and the more ability there was to be able to share the vision with them. And, and once the first homes, once the first brand new homes came in here, wow, that was amazing. It had been years since real homes had come in. No offense, Tom against the FEMA or Tory, but the FEMA homes aren't the same as bringing in a brand new mobile home, you know? And that first round, we brought, we brought in five that were from um, the coalition's money. And at the same time, we brought two in that I sold doing a spring fling with Homes of Harmony. Um, I called him up and I said, um, do you mind if I sit in one of the homes out here during your four day spring fling and have all the information about Zumbro Ridge in that home and the plans for our playground and, and all of the things we're planning. He said, no, go for it. So I did and I sold two homes during that time. And so we had eight homes come in in a matter of six weeks. Let me tell you, people's heads spun, you know, and, and they, you saw a different uplift. You saw yards getting more, mowed more frequently. You saw the weed tracking getting done more frequently. Um, you saw decks getting painted. Um, you saw windows that needed to be repaired, repaired. And uh, when I asked somebody to help do something, they weren't as readily too, bu too busy to help. Um, it was harder for them to say no. Um, that doesn't always happen like that. As time has gone on, uh, the volunteers here have, have lessened somewhat with the older folks that have been here, but the new people, when they come in and they understand that you're a co-op and you tell them um, yeah, we, we just raised $88,000 for a brand new basketball court and playground for the children. You know, they're excited. Wow, really? And, you know, it, it, you explain to them kind of where you were and where you are and that we're a co-op. And like Victoria said, poor Amanda, when she came on board um, with her home, she wasn't living here yet before she agreed to be a board member. Um, her home had to be built first before it could get here. Um, but we talked and she liked what she saw and that became contagious with the people that are coming in brand new. And that helps the overall ability of the entire community. Um, because we had so many vacancies, um, we, have brought in a lot of new people. Uh, there's been a total of 11 units now, and we have four others coming in January. Um, we're down to 15 lots, and instead of 31, there were actually 33, because we had two homes that had to be tore down. Um, and we're down to 15 lots left. Um, the goal is, awesome. Justin, Amanda, <laughs> the goal is to have 10 more come in next year, minimum. COVID put us really behind this year. Um, prices from Justin's end is a, is, good, is a problem. You know, our houses are no longer 68,000. Um, the last one was uh, 76,000. Yeah. And uh, the prices because of lumber has gone up. During mid-COVID, when there were riots going on, truck drivers wouldn't drive 
through certain cities. Um, the manufacturing company um, only had half of its staff on, which made the building of the homes back, put back sometimes up to six weeks. Um, the homes that are coming in this November, which Justin are all sold, um, <laughs> they will be here um, November 9th. They were scheduled to be here in October. So those homes, because you have to hook up utilities and so forth, hopefully will close by the end of November. First part of December at the latest, Amanda. <clears throat> and uh, Get the gas then, hooked up. <laughs> yeah, then the homes that are supposed to come in in January, that are coming in January now, were actually supposed to be here um, in December. Um, we live in Minnesota, hooking up the gas with frozen ground. The likelihood of those homes um, selling until spring or being able to be moved into until spring is, is little to none. I will have them sold though, and they will be ready to move into as soon as we can. That way, Justin can order us new homes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Homes of Harmony has really kicked up the plate. They, uh, I asked them for years before we became resident owned why they didn't bring any homes out here. My home was the last home that they brought in here new. That was 23 years ago. Wow. He looked at me and he shook his head and he said, I can't bring a home out there. And I said, why, Dennis? And he said, because your park isn't taken care of. You have poor management. You have deferred maintenance. I, I won't put my homes there. Because he's afraid he couldn't sell them. He didn't want his reputation on the line either. Right. So um, I, w I did that many, many years, many, many times, and got the same response. Mm. And he bought into our program. And today, first home springs homes in, but um, Dennis is bringing homes in on his own dime as well oh yeah you mentioned that yeah. so in addition to the 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 homes that are getting brought in uh with a revolving line of credit dennis yeah. now bought in enough where he's like well i'll i'll purchase homes place them and turn around and sell them that's right. huge that's one of his will be here in november as well and it is sold and um actually i take that back two of his I pre-sold and he brought in one more he's bringing in and I sold it. And um, in February, he's also bringing in two to four more homes. Wow. That's so, awesome. Yeah. It's this ripple effect, right? Yeah, it is. It is. So well, I kind of went off on a tangent. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, if folks have additional questions, um, they can forward them to, y'all have Emily's contact information, you've got mine. Um, if there are, if additional questions do occur to you, um, we can get, definitely get them to Allie or Justin or Amanda, but uh, we're, we're about one minute from closing out here. And so I wanna take the one minute to, to seriously thank all three of you for joining us. Thanks for coming in the evening. It makes it so much easier for our folks to attend when we can meet at the end of the day and not in the middle of the work day. So I really, really appreciate it, Justin, Amanda, and Allie. Um, this is such an inspiring story and we're really hoping at NCF to find a way to replicate this and find a way to do this in, in the other uh, communities that we work in. So um, uh, just another uh, virtual round of applause <laughs> for, for all three of you, for all the partners that have made uh, the program possible. Uh, and uh, and big shout out to you, Allie. I think it's clear to everyone on this call how much this has been a passion project for you, and um, and and how much uh, how much you get out of of living at Zumbro Ridge, and how much you've given back. Um, so so you know, hats off to you, and uh, hopefully we'll get this going in some of our other communities. Get that good vibe going. Can Thank you so much. I love your vision, Allie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I say one more thing? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Without Tom and Victoria, this also wouldn't happen. 
they I lean on them so heavily so many times. I am not computer literate in any way, shape, or form. They've taught me so much. They've taught me Tom has had my back so many, many times and has answered so many questions and you know brought me up to speed with with what owning a co-op is about and how the boards are supposed to run and what you can do what you can't do and Tori you know she's always an answer she's always got an answer you know so they have been a huge part as well and I, I so appreciate it thank you Allie Way to go, Tom. <laughs> all right, thanks all. Have a great evening. And this will be available on, on video recording on our YouTube channel. So we'll be able to share it and circulate it. Thanks all. Thanks, all.